Turkey, August 17th, 1999, 3 a.m. Only dogs can sense the imminent danger. Forty seconds that change the lives of millions of people. The vast majority of them are wakened by the quake with a magnitude of 7.4 on the Richter scale. Those who can still stand search desperately for their relatives. A group of eight Swiss aid workers arrive to evaluate the situation in Izmit and to coordinate rescue assignments of the aid units which are already on their way. The power supply has been cut and an eerie darkness envelops the city. Many residents had no chance of survival, having been crushed in their beds by several tons of concrete from collapsed ceilings. Survivors join the first rescue workers in a feverish search for others buried in air pockets beneath the buildings. The arm of a young woman. Her apartment had been on the first floor. Now it is engulfed in debris. Life and death is a matter of mere inches. The young woman has been lucky. But she does not yet know that her husband, who had been lying next to her in bed, is dead. Those who are capable of being transported are evacuated from the earthquake zone as quickly as possible. The hospital in Izmit. Doctors can only provide provisional help to the earthquake victims. The severely injured have to be treated in the courtyard. The hospital itself is in danger of collapsing from aftershocks. Remaining inside the building is too dangerous. But the hospital is not prepared. They lack even the basic blood supplies and bandages. The next morning, with the break of day, the extent of the damage becomes visible. Slowly, families are reunited. <laughs> 6 a.m. The Swiss rescue team has not had a moment of rest all night long. Turkish fire departments call them to their next assignment by radio. En route, a cloud of frustration and despair hangs in the air. But Edi Bucher, the head of the canine search and rescue unit, has not lost hope. The victims are confronted with the remains of their former lives. At the next site, a seven-story building lies in ruins. 14-year-old Mehmet cannot find his friends who lived here. About 100 people are still trapped under the debris. Deep shock fills the air. It was like a bomb. Um, and when, when we uh, go out, Ghana went out from our apartment. It, it was it was very dark and we couldn't see anything. And we we went, we start to run. The Swiss search and rescue dogs seek out the scent of the buried. Mehmet hopes that his friends will be found. The boys had grown up together, played soccer with each other, and attended the same school. They were Mehmet's best friends. Now, Mehmet doesn't know if he will ever see his friends again. One of my friends' name is Tarhan, um, Murat. They, they were in 15, 13 years old. I know them when I came here. Tension mounts. All eyes are focused on the dogs. Die Fuße Handzeichen sind das. Wenn Leute frisch verstorben. The signs vary. When someone has just died, their body and clothes still carry their scent. So when the dogs locate someone, we cannot be 100% sure whether that person is dead or alive. All three dogs have converged around the place deep in the maze of rubble. Perhaps there is a survivor. Yesterday we were playing with my uh, 
friends and today they went. They died. I, I, I don't have any new f news from them. The people, the helpers from Switzerland with the machine uh, are landing in Istanbul. Yes. Yes. driving from Istanbul to the fireware station. Only you and you, then we come here. Huh? Only you helped us. Um, no, no one came and look, look our apartments. No one helped us. Yeah. Only you helped us. Yeah. We come, we, we come Th back. Thank you very much. Yes, we come back. Yeah. The Geo Research Institute in Potsdam, Germany. A task force specifically for the investigation of earthquakes was founded here seven years ago. Professor Jochen Chow heads the task force. He knows that earthquakes are the most devastating of all natural disasters. It is almost impossible to describe the force of an earthquake if you have never experienced one yourself. The acceleration that occurs is so strong that it defies gravity. That means people get thrown sideways or up in the air. They can be shot like a bullet straight through a window. It's indescribable. If you try to measure the energy that an earthquake of this magnitude exerts, even the bomb in Hiroshima does not come close. The most powerful earthquake that we know of hit Chile in 1960. With a magnitude of over nine, it was 2,000 times stronger than the Hiroshima bomb. San Francisco, October 17, 1989. A quiet, calm autumn day. I'm gonna take a sentimental journey. Gonna save my minority. I'm gonna take a sentimental journey. The talk of the town this day is of baseball. It's the third game of the World Series, and the city is buzzing with excitement. At 5.04 p.m., the excitement suddenly turns into terror. A violent earthquake rocks the city. The baseball stadium is still standing. It was built on granite. This thing is huge. Um, I don't think anybody at all had totally ever planned for something this catastrophic. But the neighborhoods, built on landfill, are in shambles. It is the strongest earthquake in San Francisco in almost 100 years. Gas lines explode and massive fires break out in the Marina District. Throughout the Bay Area, the powerful magnitude 7 earthquake has left a trail of destruction. But nowhere is its lethal force more evident than along one of the Bay Area's main expressways. Aid workers from all of the surrounding regions are called in, among them Captain Bob Davies from the California Highway Patrol. As he arrives, a picture of devastation awaits him. When I arrived, it was surreal. Uh, it's not something that you know, any picture can do justice to. Not only the structure being collapsed, but just the, the emotion, the atmosphere that surrounded the place was one of, you know, chaos and uh, confusion, sadness. But the chaos is difficult to get under control. Right after the, the structure had collapsed, as the officers and fire personnel were, were helping the victims, there was some looting and some stealing occurring from uh, some of the local people who'd come up onto the structure to, to get what they could get, take advantage of, of the catastrophe. The shock tore through a mile-long section of the elevated road as commuters headed home from work. When the quake set in, they had no chance. There are no exits on the expressway, no way to avoid the falling cement debris. Many stopped their cars under diagonal support beams, thinking they were more stable. 
It was a false sense of security. Some of those, you know, folks that were inside those vehicles, um, you know, ended up just crushed beyond belief. Uh, there was no way to recover all the, the portions of their, of their being. Even the beams could not withstand the power of this violent earthquake. Every time we found another car, there was no survivor. Um, every time we you know, identified um, another piece of debris, it was something that, that didn't bring life, it didn't bring hope. But people were still looking for answers. People that had uh, friends and family that were traveling on that structure were reporting people that were missing that we hadn't found yet. The fifth day after the quake, there seems to be no hope of finding further survivors. Still in the dark of night is when uh, Buck Helm responded to the light from my flashlight from a distance by, by waving to me. Um, personally, it was a little bit of a shock. Uh, I had already marked him down as, as the driver being dead in that vehicle, and yet here, uh, here he was moving again. I wasn't sure at the time if I had seen something. I wasn't sure if something had blown through the structure. Uh, I couldn't guarantee that there wasn't a rodent or something that had run through the structure. But it sure looked like a hand to me. Um, once I calmed myself down and, and continued to, to look in, I did yell to him. I banged on the concrete, but I mainly yelled to him to, to see if I could get another reaction. At some point, uh, a couple minutes later, he tried to turn his head. I could see the back of his head, just his hair. I never could see his face at that point. But the rotation of his head, to me, told me this person's alive. Seriously injured after his car had been crushed down to three feet in height by a falling concrete block, trapped for 90 hours, Buck Helm had survived. Oh, Aid workers had struggled for five hours to cut him out of the wreckage. He was conscious enough to wave to, to the applause as he came out of the structure. My understanding, he did lay in the hospital on a respirator, uh, unable to talk for, for, for a week or more, uh, but then passed away a couple weeks after we got him out. Buck Holm did not survive his severe injuries. Coming back from seeing the devastation, coming home to my family who was well, how do you answer that? How do you answer, how do you thank, you know, uh, that it wasn't, it wasn't me? And it was a powerful time. Remembering back and realizing that, you know, we are not in control. And knowing that, knowing that uh, as much as we do here, as much as we try, um, there are things that we just don't have answers for, and there's things that we don't have control over. And, and deep sadness comes in, knowing that, you know, those numbers that I had been reporting were family members, were somebody's mother, somebody's son, somebody's daughter. Right here on the west coast of the North American continent, two massive tectonic plate systems meet. The border between these plates is marked by a mile-long fault known as the San Andreas Fault. Each year, the plates move two inches closer to each other. One of the plates slides under the other a process known as subduction. The energy that builds up is released as what we call an earthquake. Earthquakes have been shaking the west coast for as long as anyone can remember. In 1906, the first earthquake ever to be filmed hit San Francisco. The whole of Chinatown burned down to its foundations. Back in Izmit. It's been two days since the devastating catastrophe. 
German rescue teams have also arrived. The 65 volunteers work around the clock. Years of intensive training have prepared them well for a situation like this. But still, levels of tension are high. We're waiting for the removal machinery to get here so that we can start moving the large concrete block. Then we'll try to send the dogs up and see if there's any sign of life. Two dozen people are buried under the wreckage, and although Birgit has been on countless mountain rescues with her dogs, she's nonetheless distraught by the extent of the catastrophe here. The building had just been built. Many young families with small children had recently moved in. After two hours of seemingly endless waiting, they finally managed to lift the massive concrete block. It's really unbelievable what's happened here. Whole neighborhoods and houses are suddenly brought to the ground. It's impossible to do everything that needs to be done. The pressure on us from the people who live here is enormous. You get it every time you drive from one location to another. As soon as we arrive, we're surrounded by crowds of people. It's madness. But you have to shut it out. You have to tell yourself, they might be here, but I still have to make the tough decisions. You really can't get caught up in each individual story. Naturally, everyone wants their relatives to be rescued first. They're still hoping for signs of life. Some only realize after hours of waiting that it's too late. I was in Guljuk in Karamsa. I have a family there too. I looked for my parents and found them. But when I went to look for my cousin, this is what I found. 30-year-old Sehun and his cousin grew up together. They were like brothers. Now he's buried under the rubble with his wife and two small children. The German rescuers install geophones. Even the faintest sounds can be picked up by the sensitive instruments. So any sign of life coming from under the debris can be heard. Sehun is determined to stay here until his cousin is found, dead or alive. I've been here since Tuesday, from dusk till dawn. The hardest part is not knowing. The rescuers are tensely waiting for any sign of a response from under the rubble, knocking or scratching, any kind of sound a person might make. Nothing. Then, suddenly, we heard something, but we can't say for sure what kind of sound it is. Something's there, we just don't know what. It may be an animal, but it could also be a person. We're still looking. Hours later, the rescue teams are still hopeful, but Sehun has resigned himself. I have a car, I have a house, I have a lot of money. But what is that all worth to me now? Nothing. We're going to wait. We're going to rebuild. But it will never be as beautiful again. Birgit and her colleagues haven't given up hope. They know that it's up to them to save these lives. But the heat is unbearable. It is August and at one o'clock it is already over 100 degrees in the shade. The rescuers have to return to their camp to take a break. They're hungry and thirsty, unable to go on. 
eine schöne Dusche, was da ansteht. I'm hoping for a nice shower, a decent meal and maybe a little rest. It's all been too much to take in one day. Die Eindrücke sind zu viel für einen Tag. It's the first rest Birgit's group has had in 54 hours. But it's almost impossible for them to relax knowing that with every hour that passes, the victims' chances of survival rapidly decline. We have to get people out within the first 72 hours, otherwise their chances are next to zero. Turkey is hit by earthquakes over and over again. The country lies on the Anatolic plate, which is wedged like a cork between three mighty tectonic plates that push it sideways. The pressure that builds up as the plates muscle up against each other is released with a mighty shudder, an earthquake. This pressure also affects Greece. Three weeks later, the next large quake hits Athens. Scientists may know the source of Turkey's quakes, but they do not know when the next big one will hit. The prediction of quakes remains a mystery. The problem is most likely that the Earth's crust reacts in much more complex ways than we once thought. It is made up of many individual blocks whose interactions are complex. This can lead to very small influences causing large reactions resulting in earthquakes. For example, rain or changes in air pressure can be a factor. And if there are such small factors involved, which we can't even say for sure, then you can imagine how difficult it is to predict an earthquake. Jochen Cha hopes that one day it will be possible to predict quakes using his crackle theory. Tectonic plates crackle as they rub against each other. This seismic crackling can be detected. If the tension changes, the sound changes as well, and an earthquake is about to hit. If you take a stick or a branch and break it over your knee, there are some sticks that break right away, and there are others that crackle a bit before they break. It depends on the properties of the stick. And it's the same way with the plates in the Earth's crust. There are plates on the Earth's surface that are over 60 miles thick, and they rub against each other and get caught at the edges. The stone is forced to the breaking point, just like the stick. Sometimes it breaks right away, but at other times you can hear this crackling beforehand. Ever since its formation five billion years ago, planet Earth has been restless. Every year, researchers register 20 powerful earthquakes with a magnitude of seven or more. Most shake the ocean floor. However, 15% of them hit dry land such as Iran, May 1997. While most of the people are saying midday prayers, the earth begins to shake. 2,000 injured, over 1,600 dead. I was unconscious for 20 minutes. When I came around, I saw light coming through a hole in the rubble. Little by little, I could dig a way through for myself and my son and get us out. It was only then that I realized what had really happened. My sister-in-law came to help me, and we could pinpoint where I had last seen my daughter. We dug and scratched with our fingernails and managed to get Nina's body out. My sister-in-law then told me that the school had collapsed. My older son was at school. But help came too late for her son. Of the woman's three children, only one survived. January 1998. In midwinter, an earthquake rocks China. Aid workers from the Red Cross pass out food and warm blankets to the now homeless victims. Barely a month later, the next large quake rocks Afghanistan. The earth is torn apart yet again. The epicenter was in a remote mountain region. Aid workers struggle down roads that have turned to mud. Kobe, Japan, January 17th, 1995. A quake with a magnitude of 6.9 hits this densely settled city in the Tokyo area. 
damages amounted to $100 billion. The Kobe earthquake has been the most expensive in history. But the catastrophe also led to some important changes. Civil engineers noticed that buildings constructed prior to 1980 were much more likely to collapse. Newer structures went mostly unharmed. In 1980, safety regulations came into effect. The latest findings are striking. Skyscrapers should not be built too closely together. They need room to sway. And steel struts, which are used in the construction of bridges and roads, and which were previously thought to be earthquake safe, could not withstand the enormous pressure and had to be reinforced with elastic steel cables. In Izmit, it was mostly the newer houses that collapsed. Many developers had ignored the safety regulations and mixed their concrete with sand rather than cement. By now, the Swiss rescue teams have arrived in town with heavy machinery. I think to die is much better than waiting. For hours, the Turkish next of kin have been waiting helplessly, nerves afraid. It's the third day after the catastrophe. The survival countdown continues. Finally, everyone can help. Clothing and personal belongings have to be removed from the concrete wreckage and sorted out. Their scent confuses the dogs so much that they can't show the exact spot where the heavy machinery should be used. For doing something, I feel happy, so... At the end, I'm hel helping. It's much better than waiting. The city is in a state of emergency. Most of the stores and pharmacies remain closed for the third day running. The first bakery reopens. Production is running at the maximum. Two teams of people are busy baking bread. Still the lines are long. It's the first fresh bread available in days. In this crisis situation, the daily production is increased from 2,000 to 4,000 loaves. No one dares to move back into their apartments quite yet. Aftershocks hit at an almost hourly rate. Families have erected their emergency shelters in the open air. Some are safe from falling debris next to train tracks or in the park. They've brought just the bare essentials from their homes. One and a half million people have fled from the violence of nature. Military transporters finally bring the first desperately needed foodstuffs into the city. Olives, flour, water. It's the first shipment to reach Izmit in days. Izmit, Athens, Kobe, California. The earthquakes seem to spare Western Europe. But the experts know that this is a false sense of security. We always look at Japan, the US, Los Angeles, Kobe, Tokyo, and overlook the fact that there are big cities in Germany too that have enormous potential for such catastrophes. Cities near earthquake regions include Cologne. And it's completely possible, not just possible but scientifically proven, that a large earthquake with a magnitude of six or higher on the Richter scale could cause severe economic damage, possibly over $65 billion in the Cologne area. The first warning came in 1992. A quake with a magnitude of 5.5 rocked Germany's western regions. The epicenter lay across the border in the Netherlands. 40 people were injured. And even stronger quakes are predicted for the future. Nuclear power plants will have to be especially well prepared.
The Rhine Valley Trench is one of the three regions in Germany where we have large, powerful earthquakes. And of course, the Rhine flows there because it is a trench, and there are good reasons for building nuclear power plants next to a river. But of course, this also means that they are now close to a region threatened by earthquakes. Alaska, 1964. Here no one reckoned with such a powerful earthquake either. The earth shook for four long minutes. It is the most powerful earthquake on record ever to hit the west coast of the North American continent. But what was more fatal than the rocking of the ground was the gigantic tidal wave that towered off the coast. This 100 foot high wall of water, a tsunami, raced towards Anchorage with unbelievable speed and engulfed the city. Tsunamis are caused by quakes in the ocean floor. The water is hit with a gigantic shock wave, one not visible in the open ocean. But in shallow coastal waters, these waves can turn into monsters, dragging anything and everything in their path with them. Papua New Guinea, 1998. Today, where three villages once stood, only water can be seen. Without warning, the gigantic wave roared through peaceful settlements on the island's northwestern edge. 2,000 people died, caught unawares by the tsunami. And the weather never changed as it would have before a hurricane. In this century alone, 50,000 people have fallen victim to tsunamis. Battalions, report on Blue 4. All units, be advised, we have sustained a major earthquake in the LA Basin. Los Angeles, January 1994, shortly before dawn. A quake with a magnitude of 6.6. .6. Gas pipes burst and cause roaring fires. Their incredible brightness lit up the pitch darkness as there was no electricity. The community of Northridge, at its epicenter, was hit particularly hard. As the sun rose, the extent of the damage became clear. Freeway bridges were ripped apart. It was a powerful quake, but it wasn't the big one that experts had been waiting for for 30 years. 9.5 million people now live on this gunpowder barrel that could explode any time. To escape the unavoidable is impossible, but at least it is possible to prepare for it. All right. We still alive? Yeah. <laughs> you know what? It did make you. It actually did feel like a real earthquake. Emotionally, I, I feel very scary. I mean, very scary. I mean, imagine that could happen in my room. My only thought the whole time was thinking about my kids and I, I wanted to run home and because I think about all the, 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 the t furniture and, and bookcases and all that makes me want to make sure everything is strapped down to the wall and can't move anywhere because I know all that stuff could easily come over. In his garage, Mike Esrig converted his old trailer into the quake cottage. The mountains and the regions are all created from earthquakes. We weren't here first, earthquakes were. So um, it's going to happen. And if we can put the word out and prepare more people, then we have done our job. <laughs> They've been saying, you know, for the past 20 years that we're supposed to have the big San Andreas fault go off on us, but we're still waiting and waiting, so it's kind of weird. An affiliate of the Johnson & Johnson Corporation has organized a lunch for its employees. Mike Esrig's company, Safety Proof, is here to offer free information about earthquake safety. Employees can inform themselves over sandwiches and drinks. These are food tablets. 
they're designed for the space program. Uh -huh. They have a five-year shelf life for an unopened bottle, and 12 of these is enough food for a day. It gives you energy, helps you feel filled, it gives you some nutrition, and they, they taste great. Would you like to try them? I, I eat them all the time. Oops. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hospitals and laboratories have to be well prepared so they can operate optimally during emergency situations. As you know, we cannot um, fasten into these types of cabinets. And you can peel it off to remove it if you need to. It goes into place, it holds real strong. And then as you can see over here, what we've done is we've gone into the metal studs with a T-anchor and held on this way. So it doesn't move out into the uh, walkway here. So people are trying to exit in an emergency, it doesn't get in their way. I know, especially because it's flammable, we don't want these liquids spilling out either. Exactly. So there's some other pieces of equipment. Mike Esrig knows the big one is sure to come. His business has a future. In the meantime, the resourceful catastrophe trainer has opened an affiliate in Japan. Mexico City. 15 million people live in this metropolis. September 1985. The strongest earthquake in the country's history hits. Magnitude 8.1. More than 10,000 people died because Mexico City was built in a location where it should never have been allowed. There was once a lake there that has been filled in. So the city stands on extremely soft soil. And this soft soil actually intensifies shock waves from earthquakes so far away that they shouldn't have any power left. And to make matters worse, the shock waves have a specific frequency which puts buildings with the identical frequency in great danger. These buildings are mostly skyscrapers, which accounted for most of the collapses back then. 770 houses collapsed. 10,000 people died, only 197 were rescued. Today, Mexico City's geographical location has been turned into an advantage. An earthquake warning system has been installed. The seismographic net is linked to the city and sends the information at the speed of light. Then radio programs can be interrupted, schools can be warned, the subway can be stopped. This system works. It's the only system in the world today that can warn people directly, giving them more than one minute to react. The world's most advanced warning system has been successfully used several times over the last few years. But in southern Europe, there is another danger zone where earthquakes of incredible magnitude hit again and again. Italy. In 1997, an earthquake tears through the city of Assisi. The world-famous cultural treasures in the Basilica are damaged. A camera team films the damage in the vaults. Suddenly, a devastating quake. Not just the Basilica, but many communities in Umbria are also destroyed. The old stone walls cannot withstand the shocks. Giuseppe Fideli's house is uninhabitable. His barn has also collapsed. 28 cows are buried, even though the construction of the barn is supposedly earthquake safe. For me, it's impossible to work or sleep under a concrete ceiling. That fear is much too deep, so deep I can't express it. That earthquake wasn't just a little tremor, it was really powerful. Too powerful. Giuseppe's mother helps clear the barn. She has lost everything. All the effort that I have put into our farm. I was widowed very young and ever since have done nothing but work. Out of love for my son, I invested everything in the farm. 
God help us. Right behind the barn, the earthquake left behind the signature of its brutal power. Nineteen ninety-nine, two years later, the villages still lie in ruins. Almost everyone has moved away, but Giuseppe stayed. He hasn't rebuilt his house yet. The barn was the first priority. Giuseppe accepted inexpensive credit offered by the state. It took him 13 months, but now the barn stands tall on the same spot as the old one. The earthquakes always arrive unannounced. We're used to them. We saved our own skin and then rolled up our sleeves. For three months, Giuseppe has been living in a temporary wooden house with his mother. In any case, it's better than the trailer they had before. In my life, I've experienced so many earthquakes. To tell the truth, and I don't lie, I always sleep with my clothes on. Always. Out of fear that I will have to get out very quickly. Because here it shakes non-stop. Small and big quakes. Many fled the region. Giuseppe and Maria do not want to leave this land. Their roots are too deep here. Two years have passed since the big quake, and those who haven't left are still living in temporary containers. The people here are poor. Even church services are held in a container. There isn't enough money for a new church bell. It's extremely important to hold mass at least once a day. People need something they can rely on. It makes life a little more normal in an abnormal situation. Otherwise, they would feel very alone. Only 1,400 people have stayed in Serra Valle di Chianti. They live in fear of the next quake. But the many quakes here have also shown that there are warning signs for the catastrophes. Farmers have noticed that quite a while before a quake hits, the animals act strangely. The veterinarian has observed this as well. It was as though the animals wanted to announce that something was wrong. The sheep pricked their ears and stared straight ahead. A general sense of unease spread and the sheep tried to break out of their stall. And then the dogs barked unusually loud for no specific reason at all. The veterinarian is convinced that the animals have a type of sixth sense. She doesn't know where it lies or exactly what it might be. She suspects that it is some sort of vibration that reaches animals' sensitive ears much earlier than humans. Scientists are perplexed. When you look at the animals that come up again and again in these reports, it really is a varied list of creatures, from snakes that crawl out of holes in the middle of winter to die miserably in the snow, to cats that climb onto power lines, and horses and dogs, all kinds of animals that are all very different. One has a highly developed sense of smell, the other hears very well. And there really has to be something that all animals have in common if so many different ones react like this. If this many animals react, then somehow they have to be more sensitive than most humans. But what this ability is, and if it even exists, we don't know. What we do know is this. In Izmit too, dogs started barking before the quake hit, as if they sensed the approaching danger. And even in ancient Chinese manuscripts, there are reports of strange animal behavior. 
By now, all of the clothing has been removed from the heap of rubble. Edi Bucher and his colleagues can pinpoint the correct deployment of their machinery. Actually, we had already given up because we thought that everything had been crushed. But then we suddenly found an air pocket and were lucky enough to find these people. A small boy is rescued. And the race against death continues. We found two children. Then at the same location, we suddenly made contact with two men. We've already rescued one of them, the kids too, of course. And now we're getting a fourth man out. We've established contact with him too. And further up, where those people are, there's a woman with a baby in her arms, about six to nine feet down. We've got contact with her, but can't get any water down to her. But we have to wait, because it's too dangerous until we have the other man out. More than 20 people are still buried alive under the wreckage. The Swiss rescuers have established contact with them. But lifting the concrete slabs in two places at once is too dangerous. The air pockets could collapse. It's really tense. Earlier the men yelled up that he wasn't getting enough air because the dirt was falling through. We can't do anything. We only watch. They are going. They, they took them. They took the, the hospital. We only wait and look. We can't do anything. It's very bad. Four hours later, the trapped man is given water through a hose. A medical team is standing by. Late at night, the man is finally rescued. This man will be the last that the Swiss can free from under the house. The woman holding a baby in her arms did not survive the eight hours it took to free him. Edi Bucher heard her last words. She was just too tired and wanted to sleep. Of the other 20 people buried beneath the house, none have survived this night. Tonight it has become clear. More than 17,000 people lost their lives in the quake. Those still lying under the wreckage will never be rescued. Sehun too has given up hope of finding his cousin. For the German rescuers, there's nothing left to do but pack up. The steam shovel is busy removing the debris. The number of natural catastrophes is growing, the damage is getting more severe, and the number of fatalities is growing too. But the number of quakes isn't growing at all, neither is the number of large quakes. The damage is caused by our society's vulnerability. We are settling in areas that should not be settled in and the population density is growing. People live in highly concentrated centers, and these centers can't keep up with the infrastructure. This creates huge potential for catastrophe. And if we don't get this problem under control, if we don't get ourselves under control, then we'll never get the catastrophes under control either.
Also es ist schon so, dass man das Gefühl hat... You do get the feeling that this is something that you have absolutely no influence over. A natural catastrophe like this. It makes you so small, like nothing. The pictures, the tragedies are terrible, as are the individual stories we've heard so much about. And the desire of the Turkish people to help is really enormous. But, of course, tragedies get to everyone. It's the fifth day after the catastrophe. The German rescue team's camp is quiet. Small groups still head for various locations, but hope of finding any more survivors is dwindling fast. The camp is plagued by fatigue and resignation. There's nothing more we can do to help. It's almost guaranteed that we'll only dig out corpses at this point. If we dig, there's nothing left, nothing. Just the smell of decay. The dogs aren't giving any signals at all. We can't expect to find any more survivors. The locals have realized too that the missing are buried under the wreckage and that there's no hope left of finding them alive. They've tried day and night with their limited resources to get them out without success. Now the truth has sunk in. It was all in vain. Over the last 30 years, 560,000 people have lost their lives in earthquakes.